me through financial inclusion. I am so excited to be with these three wonderful women today on International Women's Day. Um, as, as I was um, growing up and becoming an accountant and starting work mm -hmm. at the University of Manchester, I've always wanted, I've always been surrounded by uh, fantastic women. And I think every time that I've made a big decision in my life, it's always been a woman who has supported me in this. So as we were preparing for this and I was hearing the stories and um, we've slightly moved things around that I'll be facilitating today. And you've got um, Zamaris will be speaking to us first and she has a 30 year career in global corporate banking and a real passion for enabling access to micro lending and pensions. So she's going to tell us her story and then a bit about um, this micro lending and pensions that she knows about. And um, the second, we're going to hear from Shola David Bora, and she's the chairman of the Stambic IBTC Bank PLC, and she's an advocate for giving women access to finance and, and markets. And she really drove this topic for us today. So she's got such knowledge about how to do this and how to empower women. So the talk is not just about what's happening and uh, the challenges facing uh, women, but also what we can do about it. And last but very much not least, we've got Alison Horner, who is on the advisory board here at AMBS, and she brings a wealth of rich experience from a high level Tesco roles and her work from around the globe. So she's got some really interesting stories to share with you today. But before uh, we hear from our speakers, I would just like to ask you a few questions. So I'm going to start with this first question here to see um, what your knowledge is like around uh, some of these areas of empowering women, giving women access to finance. So what I would like you to do, if you can uh, open a, a web browser and type in www.responseware.eu. And if I can ask Becky to put that in the chat box as well, that'd be fantastic. Um, I want to see, um, it's not a test, you're not going to be marked at the end of this, it's not a pass or fail kind of situation. Um, but if you can put in that session ID, IWD 2022, you don't need to enter your details, you just click on join and then just select your response, whether you think this is A, B, C or D. So if you can just look, so www.responseware.eu and your ID is at, session ID is IWD 2022. Fantastic, I'm going to ask our panel to do this as well. So if you can open up a web browser and put those details in. Although with our panel, we have already um, talked about how shocked we are. <laughs> so you already know, they already know the answer. Okay, let's get a few more responses. So with responseware.eu and your session ID is IWD 2022. You don't need to put your details in. You can just uh, choose a response. So you cl click on join and you can choose a response. Let's see how you get on. Oh, not bad, not bad. Yeah, so actually, yeah, 1975 is the right answer to this. Um, so well done, 60% of you uh, having some, uh, already have a little bit of insight into this. I was really surprised how recent this was, but um, Damaris will be telling us more about this very soon. OK, what about this one? So this is from Shola's uh, line of work. So what uh, percentage of women in sub-Saharan sub Africa have a bank account, do you think? Oh, we're getting some lots of responses in now. Let's see where you are on this. 29%. So actually, a lot of you think this is worse than it is because actually the number is 37%. Um, so no right answers, but it's not maybe not as bad as you might think. And our final question, this is from Alison's uh, work and Alison's contribution, thinking about what percentage of influencers creating sponsor sponsored posts on Instagram worldwide are women. So what percentage of influence, influencers creating sponsored posts are women? So let's get a few more responses in. Excellent. And thank you for getting involved. Good to hear from you. Oh, we've got a nice split there for you, Alison. So the correct answer is A, it's actually 84%. And we're going to go into this in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. So these are our, 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 four our three speakers today, and I'm going to start off with Damaris, and I'm going to ask her, just to start off with, um, so why is this whole topic of empowering women in the economy through financial inclusion so important to you personally? Well, thank you very much, uh, Jenny, for that introduction. 
And I'm glad lots of people got the right answer, though it is a bit shocking, isn't it? Because it's within my lifetime that uh, women were allowed to have bank accounts without having some, uh, a man sign for them, which makes me realize that my first bank account, uh, which I opened probably when I was about 18, I think my father must have had to go to the bank to sign the form, uh, though I don't remember that happening. Um, so hugely important for women like me, particularly as I grew up in a house where um, the other woman, my mother, did only unpaid work, um, to realise that I was potentially going to be much more financially independent than she was. And then the other thing that happened, which was really quite exciting, was uh, that banks started marketing credit cards to women. And I must have got my first credit card when I was in my mid 20s, which was around the time when I wanted to go traveling. And of course, traveling is so much easier if you've got that magic piece of plastic in your purse and gives you so much more freedom because you don't have to worry about running out of cash. Yeah. So that was another big milestone um, on my, in my journey. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, You're absolutely right. Yeah. I can remember the same for me when I was traveling and my card got blocked and it was such a shock. Like without my card, what do I do? It was yeah. very distressing. It's so such a vital part of being independent and being able to travel and enable to do everything in a day to day basis. So, I mean, the main message that I need to deliver is that financial freedom only comes, obviously, uh, from financial inclusion. And financial freedom makes a huge difference to women's lives because it enables you to make choices and ultimately uh, it makes you, uh, enables you to choose what you do and who you're with. Mm -hmm. Because so many women we know are trapped in relationships because they're not financially independent or free. So it's a, it's a very important thing for all of us. And although we may think here in the UK and other developed countries that the battles have all been won, as I'm going to um, sort of explain later, there are quite a few uh, battlefields where, you know, things are still in their infancy and there's a lot that we still need to do to get equality. Absolutely. Uh, so, um, during my career at the bank, uh, the 30 years I was there, uh, I, I became a, a single parent. Uh, and of course, because my, my, my husband died when my, my child was very young. And of course, that was very difficult, but it made me the breadwinner. And being the breadwinner means that you're the person who's in control and is taking all the decisions. So while it was difficult, it had its advantages. And it made me very conscious that I had to save uh, for my old, old age myself because I couldn't rely on somebody else's pension, which is apparently what a lot of women do. I couldn't rely on that as a fallback. Mm -hmm. So right from the beginning, I uh, saved into my company pension, which was a defined contribution scheme, which of course is what many people uh, now have available to them. And um, I realized, of course, that if you don't do this, you're leaving money on the table because your employer will usually match the contributions that you make tax-free to your pension yeah. up to a certain percentage. And I was quite shocked to find that some of the uh, women who I was working alongside, much younger than me, didn't seem to realise this and perhaps thought, well, they were too young to have to worry about pensions. But of course, the sooner you start, uh, the easier it is to reach your goal. And of course, now what's most important to me is the fact that in my old age, I do have financial freedom as a result of that prudence. Um, and I've got friends, unfortunately, who are not in that situation and who are still having to work in order to supplement what is basically, a, you know, a, a pretty state, a pretty basic state pension uh, and, 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 and not very much other income. Mm -hmm. So that's another aspect of it. Um, during my time at um, Bank of New York Mellon, um, I worked um, as a relationship manager for some very large companies, including um, Vodafone. 
And um, just, and this will link up with what Shola is going to talk about. Um, uh, I became aware of the um, help that they give in Africa uh, via the provision of a service called M-Pesa. So that fortunately nowadays, uh, women don't necessarily have to have bank accounts in order to be financially included because of all the wonderful new technology on their mobile phones. Yeah. So that seems to me a great initiative and um, something, as I say, which Shola, I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more later on. And then the other thing I found out about was micro lending, because um, as part of something called City Women Network, which I'm a member of and which I thoroughly recommend, uh, I'm on their charity committee. And one year we chose uh, um, a charity called Micro Loan to uh, sponsor as our charity of the year. And Micro Microloan also helps women in Africa. And what's interesting is that it is actually women above all who um, micro lending companies lend to because they find they're much more likely to get the money back if they lend to women. And they lend sometimes tiny amounts of money uh, to uh, female entrepreneurs who set up little food stands or little stands selling uh, mobile phone cards or um, flowers or jewelry. Uh, and, and these loans have apparently been transformational in those women's lives. So I think that's all I'll say for now um, and hand over to uh, the next speaker. Yeah, thank you very much. It's fascinating hearing your story and how things have not changed. We think of um men having to sign for bank accounts has been such an archaic thing but actually it really wasn't that very long very long ago and it's easy to take um to take it for granted that you can get a bank account and that you can get a pension scheme but you're right it's very much not available to everyone so thank you very much okay Shola I'm going to ask uh, you to introduce yourself now and explain why this topic of empowering women in the economy through financial inclusion is so close to your heart as well Thanks, Jenny, and um, it's great to be with you all. Um, I was born in Ghana, and I'm a Nigerian. I've lived in Nigeria for most of my growing up years. And um, I understand the challenges of living in a developing country, um, huge challenges, and women bear the brunt of these challenges in terms of unpaid labor and you know having to do a lot of, of, of the work. Um, my career has been in banking and finance for the past 30 years, um, most of it with the Standard Bank Group. And um, the last four years um, of my career, I was looking after Sub-Saharan Africa for, sub, for Standard Bank. And um, I spent those years traveling across West, East, Southern and Central Africa. And um, I've seen the capacity, the resilience, you know, the strength that African women have um, across all roles, market women, traders, small business owners, farmers, um, corporate executives, professionals, academi ac academia, you know, um, very strong women who are bearing a significant part of the burden of looking after their families. And I believe that um, despite the numerous challenges that these women face, if they are empowered, you know, they can even do more. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa cannot achieve sustainable economic growth without empowering women who make up 50% of the African population. Women are the backbone of Africa. They are the ones holding that continent up. And I believe that um, making women financially secure, like Damri said, giving them financial freedom, you know, um, has a multiply effect on their families on the societies. And therefore it's really important in my view that we give them the tools to enable them 
to grow their businesses and ultimately um, to grow Africa. Thanks, Jenny. I'll hand over to Brilliant. you. Yeah, it's really inspiring to see how some of these areas that Damaris is talking about actually do uh, resonate around the world and your experiences as well, and just how important this is and often overlooked. Thank you very much. So, Alison, if you could share your thoughts now, so a bit about your, um, your history and your story and why this topic of empowering women in the economy through financial inclusion is close to your heart as well. So I... Um... I've just uh, stopped working after 22 years with Tesco and half of that on their executive committee. And the year I joined Tesco, which was 1999, was the year that we learned, launched our grocery home shopping business in the UK. And before that, primarily, we'd had a bricks and mortar business. I concluded my career as chief executive of our Asia business and left when we were in an environment where our competition included people selling directly farm produce on Instagram, where mobile payments and using your phone both to buy and pay were the norm. But what was really fascinating is seeing how um, big business in terms of retailing almost went back to how it how it was so particularly in Asia where some of the big e-commerce sellers you know outside of Alibaba in China have been slow to play actually what's really growing now are individual um, businesses who are uh, making money uh, using their phones and their own identities and you know in many cases the, the the products that their parents had traditionally sold in markets and on farms so uh, that's you know, that's why it fascinates me. And, and having lived it, uh, I think, you know, there's so many opportunities for women within it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. I think you're exactly right. And it's really interesting to see this global, a truly global perspective from the different experiences we've got here. So thank you very much for that. OK, so um, first, in terms of... Um, to talk about their own experiences and some of these interesting statistics is Damaris. So Damaris is going to talk about both micro lending and pensions as well. So over to you, Damaris. These are some startling statistics that you pulled together for us. Yes, yes. Um, some of them are a bit shocking. Uh, so we might not be surprised, actually, to find out that the two countries in the world where there's least uh, financial inclusion for women are Afghanistan and Pakistan, where fewer than 10% apparently of women have bank accounts. And so we have to be grateful, I think, that we don't live in either of those countries. Uh, but that said, of course, there are lots and lots of countries where um, the numbers are not great. And, uh, and, and I think in every country there are fewer um, women than men who have bank accounts. But moving on to um, what might seem a more relevant topic for um, business school uh, attendees, uh, the world of venture capital finance, the statistics there are also really shocking. So apparently last year, and I got this out of Forbes, so I think it may be the US that they're talking about only rather than globally, but the US, of course, is a big part of the, of the venture capital scene. 2% of companies that receive venture capital backing um, were um, female, or sorry, 2% of venture capital finance went to companies that were uh, completely managed by women, with all women teams, in other words, 2%. And only 17.3% of venture capital finance went to companies with mixed gender teams, which means that more than 80% of venture capital finance last year, we're not talking about 30 or 40 years ago, last year, 80% of venture capital finance went to companies with all male teams, which is really quite shocking, I think. 
Now, having worked a bit in the venture capital world at the beginning of my career, um, I can see why, 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 why this happens. And it happens to a large extent because of course, most of the people working in venture capital finance are men. Uh, and apparently to the extent that there are women uh, in venture capital partnerships, they do invest in female led companies much more. Uh, because to quote, women tend to under promise and over deliver uh, in other words, they're too modest and perhaps not sufficiently, um, uh, you know, don't have enough bravado um, about, you know, um, bigging up their companies in their presentations and, and are perhaps too modest. Uh, so, so, that, so that's a problem. And we can talk about the solutions later, but certainly we need more women in venture capital, which I think like corporate finance is a really, really unfriendly um, business to work in for women with children because of the very, very long hours. So moving on to asset management, where my, and I have a particular interest in this because my daughter now works in London, in the city, in the asset management um, sphere. Uh, fewer than 20% um, of fund managers in the big asset management firms are women. And less than 8% of the assets are managed by women, which of course suggests that the, the women who are managing funds are tending to manage smaller ones. So really tough for women in that um, sphere as well. Uh, and uh, we can perhaps talk about what might be done about that. Now, you, you will know about this one, Jenny, and may want to make a few comments. While 57% of the people going into the accountancy profession are women, only 17% of the partners are women. How does that happen? Do you want to talk about that, perhaps? Yeah, well, that'll happen. that's what, exactly what happened to me. <laughs> so I started off in accounting, but I just found it incompatible with childcare, and that's what I wanted to put first. So I literally left um, being an accountant when I had my second child. So I just found it completely incompatible. And I've definitely found this from my own experience in the accounting profession and within my friends that I are also um, qualified with. That whilst we have quite good rates and our MBA now has equal rates of, of men and women, actually to, to keep progressing and to keep getting to those top levels, there are sacrifices involved, but also... Um, that a lot of women just don't want to make them um, and that means that you end up with a lot of people at the top through the, these statistics show that are um, male and that doesn't give you uh, decisions that are going to be helpful for everyone just it's bound to be biased towards men that's right and I saw that somebody's asked about the sources of these um, statistics which I can provide afterwards um, because I've got the you know I've got all the um, data sources uh, the other thing I discovered, um, very disappointingly, but not surprisingly, is that there's a 38% pension gap, meaning that women's pensions are on average 38% um, uh, smaller than men's pension pots. And um, of course, that um, arises uh, to a large extent from the, um, uh, the gender pay gap, because obviously if women are paid less, then they're going to be put, putting less into their pensions. And the hugely damaging um, period in a woman's life is um, the, the career break that many women take for um, childbearing and rearing. And um, the interval then when they may not be putting anything into their pensions at all. Uh, so, so that is a big problem and um, another one that needs to be addressed. And of course, I know that there's a discussion later this morning. In fact, I think next up is a discussion about how to fix the gender pay gap, um, which would help a lot with this. So what do we need to do to try and fix these problems? I mean, I think um, the first thing we need is we need much more financial education and perhaps we need women to educate themselves financially more. My daughter says that when she talks about money with her friends who are all extremely well-educated, albeit to a large extent, 
but not exclusively in art subjects. But even if you study sciences or medicine, you don't necessarily learn about finance. She says that her friends just don't know very much about it and they don't tend to talk about money. And there is perhaps a bit of a taboo in this country about talking about money. Um, and, and perhaps that's part of the problem. So I think there's a huge need for more financial education and for women to educate themselves about finance in general and their own finances in particular. And I understand there are various initiatives. There was one written up in the um, FT at the weekend called Your Juno, um, where some young women have got together and created an app to help women um, educate themselves financially. Um, as we said earlier, we need more women to go into these difficult areas like venture capital and asset management, um, and they need to stick at it, I'm afraid, uh, you know, and not drop out when it, when the going gets tough. I mean, you guys, I don't know how many people agreed with Sheryl Sandberg when she said you've got to lean in and crack that old hat now. But of course, um, a lot of the women I know who've been very successful in the city actually have stay at home husbands. So perhaps the moral of the story there is you've got to be careful who you pick as your partner, uh, because it would be a big advantage in your career if, you, if you're married to a man who's able and willing to stay at home or spend more time at home and spend more time uh, looking after children. Um, Helena Morrissey, who many of you may have heard of, who was a colleague of mine for some uh, time while I was at BNY Mellon, and has nine children. I mean, her husband basically has stayed at home and run the, run the home for her. So uh, unfortunately, these role swaps may still be necessary if one is to get on. Otherwise, we have to try and change the culture, but we can only do that by being there uh, to, to, to make the culture change. Uh, so yeah, shared shared parenting um, is, uh, and, and in Scandinavia, of course, the system is different because in Scandinavia, um, and apparently this makes a huge difference, um, men and women get um, leave when they have children. And if the man doesn't take his paternity leave, the wife can't take his paternity leave. So his paternity leave is lost to the couple if he doesn't take it. And therefore that doesn't happen. Whereas we don't have that in this country, it tends to be the woman who takes maternity leave, the man might take a couple of weeks, but um, a lot of them are still too embarrassed to ask for that. Um, and so the pattern is established early on that the woman is doing the childcare and the man is um, at the coal face. Um, so I think that's it for me, really. Um, I was going to talk a bit more about micro lending, and then I did a bit more research and, and, and read that it gets a bit of a mixed review. So I thought, no, perhaps I won't bang on about that. But certainly, I think it, they're, they're worthwhile charities to lend to, to to give to, because the idea that your money gets recycled, which apparently it does, they get back ninety seven percent of what they what they lend is a very attractive one. And there are some lovely stories um, on Microloans website, for instance, and Opportunity International is another one. There are several charities and I can give details if people are interested. Um, but, but there are some lovely stories about how, um, as Shola has um, talked about, women have benefited from these loans and been able to support their families. And there's this wonderful trickle down effect of this money because it benefits the children who are then able to go to school and um, have all uh, other benefits they wouldn't otherwise have. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Damaris. And thank you for everyone who's engaging in the chat box. There's a really interesting story going in the chat box as well, uh, backing up what how what you're saying is resonating with people. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much. OK, so moving on to Shola. Um, so Shola has some of these um, uh, areas of interest around these structural barriers to financial inclusion. So I'm going to hand over to you to talk through these, Shola, um, and a little bit more detail about how this... Um, the barriers in place and the kind of solutions that there are out there um, to help women. Thanks, thanks Jenny. And you know, women do face, you know, surmountable barriers to financial inclusion. The main one is finance. Um, 
there's unequal access to finance, particularly affordable credit. Um, because many of the women operate in the informal sector, um, they don't have a banking history. Um, due to various reasons, there's unequal access to land and property that um, could be security for loans. So they are um, primarily excluded. And um, that's one critical area that um, from my background in finance, I know makes a difference in terms of how you know, you can, you can grow your business essentially. The second issue is markets, um, unequal access to markets. Um, women are excluded from supply chains. They are also disadvantaged in procurement processes, whether it's a public sector or the private sector. And because invariably they are at the sort of lower end of these supply chains, they receive a fraction of income generated um, in value chains, you find out that the middleman takes most of that income. And particularly in agriculture, where you have female farmers who are largely in um, subsistence farming and you know, not, not um, involved in cash crops for exports, for instance. Um, the third area as well is um, fund managers. Um, Fund managers in, female fund managers in Sub-Saharan Africa have great difficulty in raising funds. Since 2008, um, private equity in Africa has raised 32.5 billion. Um, of that, only 15% um, was raised by female fund managers. So it's extremely difficult and overall, I think the point is there's a lack of sufficient female participation in decision making, um, you know, to, to make sure that there are deliberate policies um, that help to support women um, in their journey to financial freedom. But the good news is there are solutions. And um, the next slide does focus on some of these solutions. Digital financial inclusion has been a catalyst for women to access finance. And Damris has already mentioned M-Pesa in Kenya, where 80% of women have access to mobile money accounts because you don't need the banking history to open a mobile money account. And that trend is growing across the whole of Africa. So digital financial inclusion is certainly a key solution um, to getting more and more women to have access to credit. And also you have more banks um, providing female tailored credit products um, for women that basically talk to their circumstances. Sometimes they're linked to um, children accounts, um, insurance, education, um, fees are ad reduced or completely eliminated and just making it much more affordable um, for women to participate. Capacity building is also very important. Um, like I said, women are excluded from, from supply chains and um, the various SME incubators, you know, that have been set up across the continent, which have been very useful in providing financial literacy training um, because you know, like um, Damaris mentioned, uh, her daughter, you know, most women are financially illiterate because nowhere in your educational system do you take a financial literacy course, you know, unless you're in finance or accounts, but typically um, you're excluded from that. And um, these incubators do help show them how to set up their accounts, you know, understand their cash flow, etc. Also, business mentors are very important in kind of just holding their hands, especially in the early stages of setting up a business. Um, because many women operate in the informal sector, it's difficult for them to, um, to get access to, like I said, finance and markets. And being part of a cooperative is very important or a wider network. Um, cooperatives help to um, bring you into a formal structure 
And it's also easier to raise finance um, if you are part of a cooperative. East Africa actually has been quite um, good in this. They've set up policies, legislation to support the establishment of, of cooperatives, which you know, have really helped to strengthen the positioning of women. And in terms of um, the fundraising, um, partnerships are critical. And these are partnerships between the private sector, um, public sector, development finance institutions and NGOs um, because the challenge is significant and, and sort of one um, stakeholder is unable to make as much impact as when you all come together. Um, the African Women Leadership Fund, um, which is a $1 billion fund to be raised over 10 years, um, was set up in 2020. It's a partnership between the um, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNETA, and Standard Bank. And it is primarily geared at providing funding to female asset managers. And those are the kind of um, partnerships that I think need to be replicated across the continent um, to really ensure that women are given those tools. They're given the financing, they're given the capacity building, they're given um, what it takes to um, be able to become really much more productive agents and have greater impact in their society. Um, with the setting up, for instance, of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, you know, um, which was, which has been, has been kicked off and it basically opens up the continent um, for trade. Women have been trading across borders um, for centuries, for years, but, they're doing it informally. Um, they're doing it in small amounts. Um, it's not integrated. Um, they're not, they don't have access to the type of financing that is required. And I genuinely believe that um, a continued and deliberate effort you know, by all parties um, to ensure that um, women are included is important. And also, because of the growing importance of digital um, finance, e-commerce, um, putting in place the infrastructure that is required to enable digital finance is so important, you know, and um, more and more governments have to support telcos, banks, et cetera, um, to ensure that, you know, across the continent, um, women have access to internet and they're able to procure the products um, that they need. With M-Pesa, for instance, you have women borrowing um, small amounts of money um, and repaying it back in a day or two um, because they're able to turn that over, yeah. you know, get their, um, sell their goods and then repay those loans, which really are not it's not something that the mainstream banks can do easily. So digital financial inclusion is certainly going to be a key, continue to be a key driver for financial inclusion. And I believe that, um, you know, as we continue progressing on this journey, you know, we will see more and more women um, becoming more empowered and um, ultimately contributing, you know, their share, their quota to build in um, the continent. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, I just have one question for you before I move on. That given that it's International Women's Day, why is it so important that this is women that are given the credit programs and women that are given the access to these microloans? So why is it so vital you think that it's women that get this? Um, be yeah, be because, because um, the impact the women have, first of all, they're 50% of the population. Okay, so disadvantaging 50% of the population is gonna slow down your overall economic growth. And then more importantly, when you empower women, when they grow businesses, they spend most or more of their money on others in terms of either it's their children, um, um, communities, um, you know, parents, you know, they, they are empowering their communities. 
So it kind of has a greater multiplier effect um, on, on, on the economy. Um, but the key, the key fact is that um, you can't leave 50% of your population behind and accept to grow, you know, at, at the rate at which you would expect, yeah. you know, you need, you need everybody on board, yeah. you know, pushing and pulling together um, to take Africa where it needs to get to. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shola. Okay, and then finally moving on to Alison. So Alison's going to talk um, a little bit about her experiences on, on social media in Asia. And I really love this picture that you put up to start us off, Alison. So over to you. Uh, yeah, and I, I um, unfortunately, I didn't have one myself, but you go on the uh, public transport any day in, in Bangkok, which is where I lived, and that's exactly like it, it, what it would look like. And there's a key point here, which is there is internet on all of the uh, public transport systems, uh, much more uh, faster internet around you generally than here. But I wanted to start by painting a picture. Tesco sold its business in Asia last year after... Um, 25 years in the region. We bought the business originally uh, following the financial crisis of the late 90s, which is known in Thailand as the Tom Yum Goon crisis, so prawn Tom Yum soup. And uh, interestingly, when we bought the business, 50% of retail in Asia was what was classified as modern. So what we'd recognize bricks and mortar media, whether convenience stores or big box. And over 50% was classified as traditional, which would be the wet markets that people would be familiar with. And when we were in the process of selling the business so about 18 months ago now, I was in a, a capital markets day and one of the, the bankers uh, said to me, because oh, well, you've, you've only got one competitor in Thailand. Uh, and he mentioned the name of uh, Big C, which had been the old car for business there. And I said, no, no, that's not true at all, because um, over all of that time, the market was still split with over 50 percent of the food retail market being in the traditional sector. So wet markets. But what's been really interesting over that time is how the Internet has in my opinion, really enabled the growth and stickiness of that, that market. And I mentioned earlier that one of the things you notice when you're over there, and this is whether it's Southeast Asia or South Asia, so I ran our business processing centre we have in Bangalore, so spent a lot of time there as well, is that um, the way that we would recognise Amazon, say here or in the US, as the place to go shopping, um, just just isn't the same there. So when I when I first moved over, I had to go to a shop to buy a kettle, which I thought was really peculiar um, at the time. But then as I settled in, uh, it was very interesting. I found myself doing more and more on social media. You know, clearly I would uh, be shopping at Tesco, but there were some things that I couldn't get, and I found myself buying on Instagram. Uh, sending money through mobile payments. I bought house plants. I bought shoes. Uh, the, the thing that made me most laugh is I bought an Amazon Kindle uh, on Facebook Messenger from a guy who'd obviously spotted an entrepreneurial opportunity of getting Kindles over to, to, to people who uh, wanted to uh, download books in, in English outside of English-speaking countries. But, but, but unpicking what was going on, there's three things. Um, that really mattered. And I'll, I'll give you some statistics. So in East Asia, so China, essentially, um, there are one billion social media users. That's number one globally. Number two is Southeast Asia with 483 million users. And following that, South Asia with 470 million. Uh, now, that all um, equates to um, the people in Southeast Asia Asia in particular, spending 10 and a half hours a day on social media, which again, you think, how can that be? Uh, on their phones, sorry, not social media. So people will consume TV on phones. People will uh, buy and sell, as I've said, on phones. People will talk to each other on phones. 
And again, what I learned what's very different over there is um, so that there are phones. And uh, if I give you a statistic in Thailand, there are 97 and a half mobile cellular connections in Thailand, which means that the coverage of mobile phone penetration is 137 percent of the population. So everybody has a phone. On those phones, people, the most popular platform is Facebook, uh, but on average, people use seven and a half. But what is really different is that the uh, platforms tend to be multi-use. So if I give you an example, uh, again, in Thailand, which is you know what I was using as a, as a punter there, there's a messaging platform called Line, which pretty much does what WhatsApp does. Uh, but it also enables you to pay. You use the underground, paying using line pay, you buy and sell. You can even get someone to stand in a line at a shop for you, like a concierge service. So these, these kind of multi-use transactional payments, chat applications are at the heart of the, the economy. And it was interesting when I was researching for this, I found a woman, a 35-year-old female entrepreneur who sells false eyelashes in Thailand, and she has 76,000 followers on Instagram. And she said something which really resonated with me, which is the reason that people are happy to buy from her is because of the the one-to-one chat that they get. And again, in, in my experience of it, you know, I was really happy to send money on my payment app, which again is very easy to a seller, um, just on the basis of the chat we were we were having. And, and I think, you know, again, that element of trust, which is what Alibaba found in um, China using networks of uh, village, women in villages mainly to encourage people to order online and give the confidence over and above the simple transactional experience. So that, that female network of confidence and relationships building building businesses. So Phones are important. Everyone's got them. Internet's important. It's fast and it's everywhere. And payment is important. Uh, And what I should say is, although there are 37 and a half uh, million people use payment apps in Thailand, there's a lot of cash on delivery, too. But one of the things that the government did during COVID uh, when it was making grants to people who were suffering because there's no tourism or people coming out of cities is they made the payments into people's uh, mobile phone applications so again driving more people people there and I did want to say a little bit about the the crisis as well so the um, you know the the structure of the retail economy hasn't changed uh, the internet is, is enabling small providers. And I say a number of people uh, lost their jobs in tourism. So, so younger people would go back to come out of the cities, go back to the family farms. And again, there are multiple examples of where people have created businesses, direct customer to customer marketing using online platforms. So there's a very famous example about a fisherman he's male but he he's making about a million us a month selling shrimp directly uh, because he set up what i can only describe as a stallholder at billingsgate market uh, on on facebook there's a number of networks so uh, tudor longcorn which is a bangkok university its alumni group is now a hundred thousand strong on facebook and again people buying and selling and just um you know, kind of in, enabling their families to have an income at a time when when a lot of more formal employment was was lost. So um, again, in the, the the crisis, the confidence in chat, the different platforms, and and I was saying to Jennifer, I, I was really struck the other day. I was on Etsy. And I was looking for a knitting pattern and I came across a Ukrainian seller who was incredibly apologetic that she couldn't send, I can't remember what she was selling, sewing pads, I think. So she couldn't send physical product now out of the Ukraine, but she could do it all digitally. So just like in Southeast Asia with COVID, you know, now in in Ukraine, you can find sellers, you know, the, the geography is irrelevant because of the internet, because of phones, because of platforms, we can find sellers and we can help women 
survive crises. Um, and, you know, I think that's a really good uh, point to end. Absolutely. But what we have to what we have to do as consumers is we need to go looking for that and yeah. not just rely on the big like they are always going to Amazon, but using things like Etsy and filtering by Ukrainian women. If it's a digital project product you could buy. And I'm the same with trying to buy those kind of digital products that can still be sold and still be moved out of Ukraine is a fantastic way to support somebody, especially women facing these crises. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers. That was really, it's really fascinating to see that entire global movement as we move around the, the globe and see the different challenges that women face. Mm -hmm. And the chat box has been going pretty crazy with lots of um, uh, contributions from people, which is fantastic. And now I'm just going to, I've been speaking to one person, Reha, and if you, she's got a question for Shola. So are you able to unmute Reha? this work that's the question hi brilliant okay do you want to yeah. is it Shola you've got your question for okay. yeah I was mostly for Shola because uh, I think uh, because she was talking about structural changes and also about MPSA and uh, MPSA was introduced by Airtel as far as I remember and I used to work for Airtel and I've seen how it works but um, the same things were tried to be implemented in Bangladesh as well, I remember, and then the government kind of banned those, but eventually we had microcredit loans by Professor Dr. Yunus, who's a Nobel laureate, on the idea, like, you know, who's got popular for this. So I was just saying that, uh, how do you see the cross-sectionality and how can we address that when it comes to financial inclusion in the sense that you give loans to women, and these are microcredit loans, and only women can access that. As a result, there are women who participate, and the societies do encourage women to participate towards uh, like, you know, small entrepreneurial uh, attempts or initiatives such as sm small level farming or like the way Alison was just mentioning, having entrepreneurial ventures such as um, knitting or whatever. But the issue then is that the women get access to things, but the family's man decides what to do with that money, how the money is, money is spent, where it goes, and like, you know, everything that goes on from there on. So the woman essentially remains a, as a tool in, in many cases. How can that be addressed even when we're trying structural changes in financial inclusion? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, first of all, I think M-Pesa was um, started by um, Vodafone, not Airtel. <laughs> so just to correct that, um, their partnership with um, Safaricom in, in, in Kenya. But I think, you know, the way is education, educating both men and educating women. You know, um, the more, um, educated women are, um, the exposure they get, and also you can't leave the men behind. They're a critical part of this story, you know, um, and also exposing them and educating the men as well as to the importance of ensuring that, you know, their daughters are educated, um, their wives are allowed to, you know, develop themselves. It's important. And, and I think what you're talking about is a secondary problem. I mean, the first problem is let's grow the pie, okay? Let's bring in more income. And then the issue as to, okay, who's deciding who spends what, et cetera, it's, it's, it's education. And obviously there are cultural issues involved as well. Um, but certainly, you know, it's a good problem to have, to have money and then start discussing how you're going to spend it rather than not having anything at all. And I think, you know, the work that um, the, the micro um, uh, bank in, in, in Bangladesh, um, the Brahma, Brahma Bank, is it? Um, Grameen Fund. Gra Grameen, yes, Grameen, sorry. Um, you know, it's, it's world-class, it's, it's stood out. It's, set, it's, it's been a template that many have followed and it has empowered so many women, you know, and, you know, I find the early stage of setting up a business is the most critical and just getting the, getting the women to understand that they can do it, building their confidence mm -hmm. and enabling them to work with other women and even other men and grow their business is so powerful, you know, and one just has to continue to encourage that. And I believe that, you know, um, the benefits that come out of that engagement, um, it's almost like a multiplier effect as well. It just gets better. And, you know, um, people understand that the, the benefits far outweigh the costs.
Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, so we, we are rapidly uh, coming towards the end of our session now. So there is a question that I want to ask each of you. And if I share my screen again, um, that will able, enable me to ask it. So it's all about uh, taking action. So I think uh, often when we're faced with these startling statistics and um, very big, scary global events, um, it's really important to think about way, where and how you can take action. So um, starting with Damaris, can you recommend anything we can do to take action to help empower women through in the economy through financial inclusion? Well, I think it's this financial education, isn't it, that we've got to take action on. Um, I know the FT started a, a, an initiative to improve um, financial education, and I did mean to sign up for that. Um, I suspect they want money more than people, but certainly uh, we do need, if possible, and we have the opportunities to, uh, to, to volunteer to provide financial education. Uh, those of us who feel sufficiently knowledgeable to do that. So I would say that's the number one thing from my perspective. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Shola, what's your number one thing for taking action? I think it's deliberate policies that actually address breaking the bias. Um, I find that once you've put in place a specific policy, it helps focus the mind because, you know, you can talk from now till kingdom come. But once you actually put in place a policy um, that enables this action or you, you actually put in place uh, a platform or a vehicle, you know, that can actually execute, you know, on these um, plans, then you begin to see a difference. And the other thing that I mentioned was partnerships, you know, doing this together helps to increase the impact. Thank you. Brilliant. And Alison, what do you think, what would be, your, would be your one thing to take action to empower and women? Then if you've got the time and the money, make the effort to find women owned businesses to spend your money in rather than the easy, big retailers online or offline. Yeah, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and finally, uh, what I'd like the people in the room to do is if you could do a final vote on here to see if you will take action. So again, we're, we're still on www.responseware.eu and the session ID is still IWD 2022. You can just select join and it'd be really good to hear if any of you are inspired to take some action as a result of this, that you do anyway, and that you need to find out more. I've not included no as an option, by the way. <laughs> 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 for a very good reason <laughs> and I think yeah LinkedIn's a great way I've seen some LinkedIn um, uh, profiles being passed around and that's fantastic I think if we can come together and uh, try and do these small actions they can have a really big difference so thank you very much for everyone who's taken part in uh, the session today a huge thank you to all our speakers thank you for Damaris and to Shola and to Alison and for Becky and all those people there in the background making things go smoothly and I hope you have a wonderful International Women's Day thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you Jenny thanks